worldview is very broad and it's full of paradoxes. So on one hand, you have a statement like Onye kwe kwe. And on the other hand, you have a statement like Urichinder Adakabuyakabu. That means that on one hand, we believe in free will. But on the other hand, we believe in predestination. That is why the great Chino Achebe told us that greatness, like the mighty Iroko, cannot be planted. You may scatter its seeds where you choose to scatter it, but the tree will grow where it chooses to grow. I say this to tell you that Nigeria is an Iroko. It is a country that is uniquely located and uniquely constituted, and for that reason, is saddled with a fate it did not choose and carries a destiny it cannot escape. And I'll explain why I say this. You can tell that Africa and South America were once part of the same continent. Because if you look at them on the map, you see how they fit together like the broken pieces of one plate. And Nigeria exists along that jagged line where those two continents broke apart. In fact, Nigeria exists at the junction where that ancient supercontinent almost broke into three instead of two. So in that sense, from a geological perspective, Nigeria exists at a unique meeting place. Nigeria stands at a crossroad. Now, in the history of the slave trade of the African continent, there were three major routes by which people were taken out of the continent as slaves. The oldest of them is the trans-Indian route via the East African seaboard to destinations like Madagascar, Southeast Asia, and India. And then you have the Trans-Saharan trade route by which Africans were taken across the desert to destinations in North Africa and the Middle East. And then you have the Transatlantic, the most notorious of them all, by which people were taken across the ocean to destinations in the Caribbean and the Americas. Now, Nigeria is one of the few African countries today that harbors cities that participated in all three historic slave trades. So you have Kanen Borono, that was at the tail end of the Trans-Indian Network. You have the Alsa city-states that were part of the Trans-Saharan Network. And you have the coastal cities of Lagos, Badagri, Fokados, Boni, Calabar, that were part of the Trans-Atlantic Network. So in Nigeria, these three trade routes all intersect. So in terms of that forced dispersal of Africans across the world through the instrumentality of slavery, an event that has great cultural significance for black people everywhere, Nigeria exists at a unique meeting place. Nigeria stands at a crossroad. Christianity and Islam are both Abrahamic faiths that were born in the Middle East. They are two of the three great monotheistic religions of the world. And between the two of them account for over half of the world's population. In most countries where these two religions exist, one tends to dominate the other in terms of population. So a country is usually predominantly Muslim, or the country is predominantly Christian. Nigeria is the only country in the world where this is not the case. Nigeria is the only country in the world that exists on both lists. On both the list of the top 10 countries with the highest Christian population, as well as the list of the top 10 countries with the highest Muslim population. Nigeria is the only country in the world where Christianity and Islam meet as demographic equals. So in 
In that sense, coming from the perspective of the religions, Nigeria exists at a unique meeting place. Nigeria stands at a crossroad. And this has always been the case. Before Lord Lugard, before Flora Shaw, before Jaja of Opobo, before Usman Danfodio, before Kotal Kanta, before Ezenri, here at this junction between North, West, and Central Africa, Nigeria has always stood at a crossroad. And crossroads are special places in African mythology. That junction where different roads meet in African mythology has always been a place where great power is believed to reside. This is an African belief. And like many myths coming from the ancient world, it carries within it a kernel of truth. For the magical crossroad of African mythology is a metaphor for the modern concept of a melting pot, for a place where different energies and forces intersect, interact, and intermingle. The magical crossroad of African mythology is a metaphor for the modern developmental concept of diversity. And today we know that wherever you find diversity, there you will find great power. Wherever you find a space where different thoughts and ideas, peoples and cultures, energies and forces can intersect, interact and intermingle, that there you will find some of the most remarkable manifestations of creativity possible to the human spirit. Today we know that diversity is a great spark for creativity. And that is why it is not surprising that this area that is today Nigeria, standing as it does at a unique crossroad on the African continent, has always been the scene through history of some of the most remarkable achievements ever recorded in sub-Saharan Africa. Because that is the type of spirit you find at crossroads. It is not surprising that the oldest known sophisticated civilization in sub-Saharan Africa, the Nok civilization, it is not surprising that it arose here, near that junction between the Niger and the Benue. It is not surprising that the takeoff point for the greatest migration in African history, the Bantu migration that spread Bantu language and culture all across sub-Saharan Africa, an event that altered the sociocultural texture of Africa forever, it is not surprising that the takeoff point for that migration was here, near our border with Cameroon. It is not surprising that this geophysical space has always been so prolific through history when it comes to the formation of dynamic states. It is not surprising that so many of the great iconic pre-colonial West African states just happen to form here from Kanem Borono to Benin, from the Yalsa city states to Oyo. It is not surprising that of all the states that emerged out of the randomness of colonialism, with its arbitrary drawing of borders, of all the states that emerged out of that randomness, the biggest of them all, the giant of them all, the most populous of them all, just happened to emerge here at this unique crossroad on the African continent. It is not fluke. That is the type of spirit you find at crossroads. From the ancient iron smelting furnaces of Unsuka to the sophisticated terracotta sculptures of Jema, from the bronze artifacts of Ibuku to the lost wax casting techniques of Benin and Ife, it is not surprising that so many instances of the earliest recorded manifestations of creative and artistic outputs in sub-Saharan Africa happen to happen here. But that is the spirit you find at crossroads. And that creative energy has continued from ancient history till modern times because our people say that And that is why it is not surprising that so many of the writers, of the artists, so much of the dance, of the music, of the fashion, of the food, of the business, of the tech, 
of the trends that have put and are putting Africa on the map today, it is not surprising that so much of that energy is coming out of Nigeria. For that is the spirit you find at Crossroads, the spirit of the traveler, the spirit of the adventurer, the eternally curious and young spirit of creativity. It is not a fluke that we are the way we are. What is surprising is how little the modern Nigerian government reflects the spirit of creativity that naturally occurs in a geophysical space like this. How can a people who are so naturally, historically, culturally inclined towards creativity, how can they regularly produce governments that are so mediocre? That is the paradox at the heart of this modern country. And to understand that paradox, you must understand the nature of our diversity. You see, it is the same diversity that makes us so brilliant in some areas. It is that same diversity that makes us so uninspiring in others. The same diversity that makes us so ingenious when it comes to art, culture, sports, business, entertainment, is the same diversity that makes us so problematic when it comes to civic engagement, to voting, to electioneering, to the mechanics of putting a government in place. The same diversity that lifts us up when it comes to creative entrepreneurship is the same diversity that drags us down when it comes to politics. Diversity is the paradox at the heart of our modern country. It is a paradox because it carries within itself a blessing and the curse. To be diverse is to be blessed, and to be diverse is to be cursed. The blessing enhanced creative energy. The curse enhanced difficulty in getting people of different tribes and tongues to see eye to eye. But diversity is a paradox, but it is not an unresolvable paradox. It is not a sphinx that cannot be answered. It is not a riddle that cannot be solved. It is not a virus that cannot be vanquished. Diversity is a resolvable paradox. To manage our diversity in a way that allows the gains it gives us in increased creative output not to be offset by the headaches it causes in increased tensions between identity groups. Diversity can be managed. And we have the key for managing our diversity successfully. We already have it in our hands. It is in our history. It is in our heritage. It is in three broad principles that were left to us by the three principal statesmen that negotiated the independence of our nation. And I'll tell you what these three broad principles are. Number one, respect. We must respect our differences at all times. The fact that I do not look like you, or talk like you, or dress like you, or worship like you, does not mean that I am less than you. You must not assume that your ways are in and of themselves better than my ways. And I must not assume that my ways are in and of themselves better than your ways. If it matters to you, then for that reason it should matter to me. And if it matters to me, then for that reason alone, it should matter to you. Our peculiarities must always be treated with sensitivity. And the things we value as individuals must never be brushed aside casually in any conversation about our future. This is what the Sadauna, Saamadu Bello, meant when he responded to Zeke, who is reported to have said to him, let's forget our differences. And to this he said, no. Let us understand our differences. One, respect. Number two, autonomy. Our differences must be given some level of autonomy, some room to breathe. I must have a space that I can, to the most part, arrange as I want. And you must have a space that you can, to the most part, arrange as you want. Our society does not have to be a monologue. It does not have to be monochromatic. That is, our society does not have to be one color. 
one language, one tribe, one religion, one way of seeing things, one way of doing things. No. Our society can reflect the natural world around us, where diverse ecosystems and life forms come together to make life habitable on this planet. Like this, we must evolve a system that does not automatically punish anybody simply because they are different. Like this, we must evolve a system that allows all flowers to bloom. This is why Chief Obafemi Awolowo, all his life, advocated for a federal system of government. For a system of government where each identity group could have its own space that it can arrange to the most part as it wants. This is why he was a lifelong advocate for federalism, for a system of government that allows our differences to breathe. Two, autonomy. Three, no matter how diverse we are, we must have points of convergence. No matter how diverse we are, we must have a minimum set of values and issues and ideologies that bring us together. For no matter how deep our differences go, they do not touch down in our very spirits. Beneath our differences is a common humanity. Because ultimately, the blood that runs through the veins of a northerner is red like the blood that runs through the veins of a southerner. Ultimately, the blood of the pain of living in a society where the rights of the weak, of the vulnerable, of the minority, of the non-indigent are not respected, the pain of living in a society like that is as piercing for the Muslim woman trying to make a home in Enugu as it is for the Christian man trying to make a home in Katsina. Ultimately, when a mother loses her child to armed Fulani bandits in Zamfara, her pain is as raw, her frustration with the inability of government to act is as deep as that of a woman who loses her son to unknown gunmen here in the world. You see, the floods will not ask, where do you come from, before inundating your compound. The bullets a terrorist fires will not ask, are you a Christian or Muslim, before piercing through your heart. Our differences do not discriminate amongst us before attacking us. So we cannot afford to discriminate amongst ourselves when we attempt to rise in defense, no matter how diverse we are. There must be issues that bring us together. This is what Dr. Nandi Azikiwe meant when he said that there must be a set of laws to which all Nigerians are subject and a body of rights to which all Nigerians are entitled. These are the principles that together constitute the ideology that powered the Founding Fathers' commitment to the concept of One Nigeria. This is the ideology that that concept is historically rooted in. It is an ideology that depends on respect for our differences and a commitment to our shared humanity. This is the ideology that will allow us to resolve the paradox that is our diversity in a positive and sustainable way so that we can manifest cultural pride without degenerating into tribalism, so that we can exhibit our ethno-religious differences without losing the capacity for collective action as one black nation so that we can remain diverse, fiercely and proudly so, without losing the great benefit of standing as one African people at this unique crossroad on the African continent. For I tell you, the world will remain unbalanced and incomplete till Africa rises to its feet. And Africa will stay on its knees until such uniquely positioned and constituted nations like Egypt, like Ethiopia, like Congo, like South Africa, until such uniquely positioned and constituted countries like Nigeria rise to their feet. This is the fate we did not choose as Nigerians, but this is the destiny we cannot escape as Nigerians. We must rise up to it, and the generation that is capable of doing it is here. Thank you.